I'm starting today, I'm starting on page 271 with metacognition. Metacognition. Gotcha, Hungji. So, what are we going to say about metacognition? Well, let's start out by asking you to think about something that tastes good. Did something just pop in your head? Or did a whole bunch of things pop in your head? Something that tastes good. Did one thing pop in your head? Or did a bunch of stuff pop in your head? How many had one thing pop in your head? One, two, three, four. How many had a bunch of things pop in your head? One, two, three, four, five. How many had nothing pop in your head? One. I don't know why. Before class started, <coughs> when I uh, was getting ready for this little exercise I'm doing, got you cares. I asked myself to think of something that tastes good. And I was sitting there thinking about these things that taste good. Now I stand up here and say, think about something. We're on page 271 talking about metacognition. Think about something that tastes good. And my mind just went blank. None, none, none of that stuff I was thinking about before popped into my head. Now, see, now we're going to do some metacognition. Why did your mind go blank, Tom? I don't know. Okay, so why did some of you think of one thing and, and some of you think of a bunch of things when I said think of something that tastes good? Is it Rachel? Good. Gotcha. So why did some of you think of one thing <coughs> For those who thought of one thing, why do you think <coughs> just one thing came to mind? Any ideas? For those who thought of a bunch of things that taste good, why do you think a bunch of things came to mind? That's how fast um, different individuals were processing the question asked. Differently? Because when I said think of something that tastes good, some of you were thinking I have to zero in on one thing, and some of you were thinking it could be anything. You say, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I, I don't think about what I'm thinking or, or why I'm thinking it. You don't? Well, you're missing out on a whole bunch of fun in life. You go, I am? Yeah. It's called metacognition. Just thinking about your thoughts. Okay, now we'll try it again. Everybody think of one thing that tastes good. Ah, something came to my mind that time. Did it, does everybody have one thing that tastes good? Okay, on the count of three, everybody say what came to your mind. One, two, three. Peaches. Peaches. Okay, what did we say again? <coughs> Brownies. Brownies? Spaghetti. What? Spaghetti. Spaghetti? Pizza. What? Pizza. Pizzas? Pizza. Pizza. All right. No, pizza. Pizza. <laughs> oh, all right. I like pizza too. Yes? Pizza. Pizza? Uh, cheesecake. Cheesecake? Mm -hmm. Brownies? Cake. Cake? Any particular kind? Hey, <laughs> hot cake, cold cake. I just like cake. Shrimp. Shrimp? Pizza. Pizza? Cookies. Cookies? Hamburger. Hamburgers? Cookies. Cookies. <coughs> Why did a bunch of you people think of pizza? <coughs> Why did a bunch of people think of pizza? Those who thought of it, do you know why you thought of pizza? 
Did you just have it last night in the cafeteria? You just like it. You would it be fun if they had pizza every day in the cafeteria? No, you but you just like pizza. See, I said peaches, and I'm thinking, yeah, if they had peaches every day in the cafeteria, that'd be great. They do have peaches every day, don't they? Over on the salad bar. <coughs> I guess they do. I've been there for a while. Why why did some of you say what'd you say? Brownies? Oh, you know something? I'm about to change my mind. I thought peaches, but when you say brownies, I think of the brownies that my wife makes. Oh, man. She's got this formula for making brownies that, uh, they're out of this world. They're just unbelievable. And when she makes them, I eat way too many of them. And right now, I said peaches, but that didn't affect me very much. I, I'm talking about these brownies and my mouth is watering and I have to swallow all this saliva that it's producing because there's no brownies in there to soak it up. Why? Why is talking about brownies causing saliva in my mouth? Because I just think I'd like to have some. So think about Th metacognition is just thinking about your thoughts. And since I changed from peaches to brownies and noticed my mouth was watering and then wondered why is my mouth watering, that's metacognition, I thought maybe it's because we were just talking about this last night. We looked at the grocery list and said what kind of stuff's on sale and we go, whoa, look at that, somebody's got brownie mix on sale. And my wife said, good. I'll make brownies for Thanksgiving. And I thought, oh no. If she makes our brownies for Thanksgiving, all of our company will eat them all up and there won't be as many left for me. Well then I know what I'll do. I'll just go buy, it said limit, four boxes on the ad. I'll go buy four boxes. No, then she'll just <clears throat> cook off four of them at one time and have that many brownies for Thanksgiving. Then I'll go back on another day and buy four more boxes. I think I'll go back three days in a row and buy 12 boxes so there'll be plenty of boxes for her to make me some brownies so that I can turn into a walking blimp <laughs> from eating brownies. <clears throat> what made you think about that, Tom? You understand? Metacognition is just asking yourself, why am I thinking the thoughts I'm having. Why are those thoughts coming to my mind? And <clears throat> it's healthy to do that just so you start to, well, one is you are, are, are exercising your thinking abilities, but the other thing is that you're, the more you start to do that, the more you incline to say, I can, I can regulate my own thinking, I can regulate my own life, it kind of contributes to this principle called self-regulation that we'll talk about uh, later on in another chapter I think probably so just practice thinking about your thinking processes and why you think the way you do page 273 talks about another concept that's important and that's differentiating your own beliefs from other people's beliefs. Did you know that five-year-olds think that two people who are looking at the same picture will have the same thoughts about the picture? That's just the way they are. If I said, look outside, the rest of you had a windows blind, Look outside, and what do you see? A little kid would say, everybody sees the same thing. Now, are all of you looking outside to see something? Okay, just for fun, what did you see when you looked outside? Is there anything outside that's catching, you say, I saw a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, is there anything that kind of stands out in your mind? The car lot. The car lot? A squirrel. A squirrel? Where's the squirrel? 
There he is on the sidewalk. I didn't see him before. So, see, why did I jump on there? Because I didn't see it out there before. What else did you see? What caught your attention? The trees. The trees? The trees? A number of you saw the trees? Those trees are appealing, huh? Is it Uriah? Yes, sir. Gotcha. <coughs> So, what did the rest of you see out here? A bunch of, I, about four people shook your head and you saw trees? Okay, don't look outside now. Did anyone, just look up here at me, did anyone see a little kid's toy out there? Nobody? Who? No, nobody saw a little kid's toy? Outside? Yeah, nobody. Yeah. Rest of you look out there. Do you see that little pink? Tricycle sitting there on the sidewalk? Not for mine. Oh, oh. See, Tom, you're acting like a five year old. I'm up here looking. We're up here looking. And we see that little tricycle with a pink seat on it. But is there something blocking the view back here? <coughs> yeah. You people can't see that little pink tricycle out there. Yeah, go ahead and let's pull this open and see if we can fix this. I don't think he will. <coughs> there, just barely you can see it, right? So, you see, what you do as you grow and become more adult, supposedly, you get over this five-year-old mindset and you you just know that people see a lot of different things when they look at something. And you acknowledge that and you recognize that. And what we probably ought to recognize is that when we're looking at something, when it seems like we're all looking at the same thing, there probably are, I'm going to say, at least a half a, dis half a dozen different things that people are seeing, and there's several people will see the same thing, but not everybody's seeing, well, even, even the four people who shook their head on the trees. Now, let's all look outside and look at the trees. Okay, what, what jumped to the front of your mind when you looked at the trees outside? <coughs> I mean, what's, what's the big impression on the screen? What, what's popped up on the screen in your head when you look at those trees? The colors changing. The colors are changing? Is that what most of you noticed? What did you notice? Uh, God. What, what stood out in your mind? Uh, Genesis. The what? Genesis chapter 1. He said Genesis 1. Yeah. Because of Oh, the, beauty the, the beauty of it and God created it did anyone okay all those colors out there I've been enjoying all the colors but for some reason when I looked out here and saw this tree I thought whoa why is that tree got all that green on it see that one tree it's got a whole bunch of colors changing then it's got this little part here at the back that's just almost still green <coughs> why would that be why would that be green Is somebody thinking, who cares why it's green or not? Why do you go around asking questions about all this stuff? Who cares about all that stuff? I don't know why. I'm just curious. Anybody want to guess at why those leaves on this part of that tree are still <coughs> green and the rest of them have all changed colors? It's because they're not dead yet. Why are they still alive? Does it have anything to do with the fact that it's growing on the back side of the tree where it doesn't get as much sunlight? Probably. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just theorizing about it. I'm just guessing. And one time, one of my grandchildren said to me, when we were driving around the car looking at stuff, and I was trying to engage my grandchildren in this metacognition stuff, and looking at things and, and, and asking who's, who saw what, 
They go, Poppy, why do you ask so many questions? And I thought, why do I ask so many <laughs> questions? Because I just don't do it in class. I just do it in life. And then I think, is it because I'm curious? And then I, then I think, some people call curiosity being nosy, <laughs> minding other people's business. And then we all know that famous phrase, don't we? Curiosity did what? Killed the cat. Killed the cat. I don't know where that came from. Does anyone know where that came from? <clears throat> They're too curious and then they get killed And somehow. they get in trouble? I'm thinking the most curious animal I've ever seen are those goofy squirrels who run out in the middle of the road when you're coming down the highway and look at you to see what you're going to do. <laughs> I'm going to run over you. That's what I'm going to do. Well, I used to do that. Anymore, you know, I used to think that if the animal isn't smart enough to get out the road, it's my job to take the animal out <laughs> and turn him into roadkill for some little animal to eat because the rest of them have to have something to eat and they might as well make dinner out of a squirrel who doesn't have the sense to get out of the road when a car's coming. But I've discovered that in order to improve the gas mileage in cars, they change the way they make them. Have any of you noticed that? It used to be, you hit a squirrel with a metal bumper, he's toast. He's going to be somebody's meal. Some scavenger is going to eat him before the day's over. Today, in this day and age with these cars, you hit a squirrel and it'll probably crack your plastic bumper. What is that all about? I thought bumpers were made out of metal just so you could take out the squirrels that don't know any better. And my grandchildren used to say, what's out, Poppy? I said, you know what? If I don't run over that squirrel, somebody else will. He's just not smart enough to live long enough to avoid becoming somebody's lunch. So it says that uh, we need to be talking to children on page 273 about their mental states, such as their desires. Now, that would happen. I'm asking all these questions with my little grandkids, haul them around the car, and they say, Poppy, why do you ask so many questions? And I'm going, I don't know. I'm just curious about stuff. And then so I say, so what would you little kids like to do? Any idea what my little preschool grandchildren said when I had them in the car, in the van, and we were driving around, and I said, what would you kids like to do? Any idea what little preschoolers say when you ask them, what would you like to do? Go to the park, maybe? Go to the park. Any other suggestions as to what those little kids might say? My grandkids kept saying all the time, go to McDonald's. How did McDonald's become so popular with uh, three to six year olds? The play place. What? The play area. That's why they wanted to go to McDonald's. It wasn't so much for the food. They wanted to go to McDonald's Playland. Who ever heard of a fast food restaurant if you would have worked at McDonald's years ago and you would have said, I have a brilliant idea that will improve our customer base. And you go, and they go, what? You go, let's build a playground at every McDonald's so little kids will want to come there to play. What's your first thought about that idea if it had never happened? It's smart, actually. You, th you think that's smart? Think See, so. for me, my first thought is that's a dumb idea. If you want to build a playground for the kids, build it at the park where they can go play. No, let's put a little playground right here at the restaurant. And see, I thought, and, and I'm thinking, why did, why, did, why did Karis think it's a smart idea and I think it's a dumb idea? I don't know, maybe she has more experience in marketing than I do. Maybe I'm kind of stuck in a box and I just think playgrounds ought to be in a park. So if you're going to build a playground at a fast food restaurant, that doesn't fit in my little framework of thinking. So what do I say? That's a dumb idea. No, it's just an idea that's outside my little framework. Well, yeah, and if it's outside my framework, it's a dumb idea. No, it's just an idea you haven't thought of. Well, yeah, it's a dumb idea. It's like get over calling everything you didn't think of or doesn't fit in your little box of thinking. Get over calling it a dumb idea. 
you say that's kind of bizarre or that's a that's a, that's a different thought I never thought of that I would have never thought of that on the other hand how many times have you looked at something and said why didn't I think of that some big money-making idea that someone thought of and after you go wow why didn't I think of that and I'm sure the other fast food places after McDonald's did that thought Maybe we ought to build a playground too. Do some of the other fast food places have playgrounds? Are they as good as McDonald's? They are? They are? They are? You don't know? The only other one I can think of is Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A? And that one, is, that one gets business for its food more than the playground. So. <laughs> so, is Burger it? Burger King has one too. And what? And I don't know about here, but in Michigan, the Burger King in my town has one. The Burger King in your town has one? Does your Burger King have a playground? You go, I don't know. I don't go to the playground. I just go to the fast. I just go there for the food. Well, and I found out that my grandchildren like to go there to play. So I thought, well, we'll just take them there and let them play. So I take them there and I sit down in a chair and I let them play. And I'm smelling all this food cooking. What happens when you start smelling hamburgers and french fries? at McDonald's or Burger King or Chick-fil-A. Oh, you don't smell hamburgers. I love to go to Chick-fil-A and say, can I have a hamburger? <laughs> I just think that's so cool to pull in there and order a hamburger. You know what they say when you do that? We do not serve hamburgers here. We only serve chicken sandwiches. Okay, I guess I'll take one of those instead. I just think it's cool to order something that they don't have. Just to see what they'll do. I'll tell you another thing I like to do is when they tell me how much money I owe, I like to give them the exact <coughs> dollar bills and then give them some change, but give them too much change. I do this when I have a grandchild with me. I say, it said, it said the bill was $3.27, so let's give them $3.37 and see what they do. See if they keep it or give it back and say, you gave me too much money. Sometimes they give it back and sometimes they keep it. And it's too late to say, I gave you too much money. What am I going to say? I gave you too much money to see if you were going to keep it or not. I just let them keep it and go on my way. Because it's part of what I spend to teach my grandchildren that you got to be careful. And, and of course, now I tell my grandchildren this. See, this is what happens when you get old. There are two age groups that have to be careful when they go shopping. Little kids because sometimes the clerk will shortchange you so they can put it in their pocket and old people because we can actually give them a $20 bill and forget whether we gave them a 20 or a 10 or a 5. Old people are notorious for forgetting and sometimes they'll take advantage of that. Just I'm just saying that's just the way life is. Why do they see life that way? Well they're looking to make a little extra money. Talk to children about their desires. What would you like to do about their emotions? In fact, I can say to my grandchildren, so how do you feel about me asking all these questions? And they go, I get tired of all your questions, Poppy. It's like I'm in school. And I'm thinking, oh, well, I didn't mean to turn this into a classroom. I just was curious about what you thought about all this stuff. I'm laughing now because it's fun to take a grandchild and we're going from point A to point B, and he's been on that route like a dozen or so times. So this little kid knows how to get from our house to the grocery store. So I will deliberately go a different direction to see what they'll do. And sometimes they'll say, Poppy, you're going the wrong way. I'm going, I am? They go, yes. I said, so, so what should I do to get there? And so they say, you should turn up here. And I say, which way? So they said, uh, that way. So I go, okay. And I say, now what should I do? And after a while, we drive around for a while and get lost because they don't know where they're going. They're just trying to get us turned around, head in the right direction. And then since I know where I am, I say, let's try this and see what happens. And voila, we snuck up on the store from the back way. Oh, aren't you glad you're one of my grandchildren? I just mess with those kids. Because it's so much fun. They're thinking. What makes you think that way? 
I ask them about the way they think. I have to tell you, sometimes my grandchildren are more willing to tell me what they're thinking about their thoughts than people in my classes are here at the college. About knowing, what do you know about this? What do you know about that? Just ask them, what kind of stuff do you know? Do you know why the leaves turn colors in the fall? The leaves are dying, right? The leaves were alive, and now they're dying. Oh, how tragic. All the little leaves on that tree are dying, and they're going to fall to the ground. But they're so beautiful. Why are they so beautiful when they die and fall to the ground? <coughs> Would all of you agree that when they change colors, they're beautiful? <coughs> Those are beautiful colors out there as compared to the green. Is it because they're all different, maybe? What? <clears throat> maybe because they're all different. Different like, trees? Like it's just like it's changing. Kind of like when we have the first snow, it seems really pretty. Like it's because your environment's changing. Okay. Because we just like seeing a change in the environment. Do, do different trees have different colors when on their leaves are different colors when they change? Do some, okay, which tree has the prettiest leaves? <coughs> maple trees? Do all, the, do all the maple trees have the same color leaves? Can you have two maple trees in your yard and the, the leaves will be a little bit different color when they fall off? Why is that? And now, can you hear my grandchildren say, I don't know, Poppy. Why do you ask so many questions? And I just want to talk to them about what do you know about stuff? And is it okay if we, if we reach the place where there's a whole bunch of stuff in life that I don't know? No, I'd rather not talk about that. Why? Well, that makes me sound like I'm not very smart. What? No, it just... It just tells you there's a whole bunch of information out there that we don't know anything about. I mean, that shouldn't bother us. Well, it bothers me. Well, why does it bother you? Well, I don't know. It just bothers me. You understand? Think about your thoughts. It's like, hey, there's a ton of stuff out there. Now, it's like, I might not know exactly why they change to the colors they do. There's probably some chemistry going on here, and there's probably some scientific explanation. But guess what? When when who was it? Rachel? When Rachel said they're beautiful to the human eye, I'm going, aha, I think God set the system up so the trees put on beautiful colors so we could enjoy the time when all the leaves die. I think he did that just for our enjoyment. I mean do any of you like to eat rainbow trout? Not only does it taste good, it's also what? Beautiful to look at? So how come he made catfish so ugly? <laughs> any of you ever been to Colorado? I grew up in Oklahoma. <clears throat> the first time I went to Colorado, I go, whoa. <clears throat> what happened here? That's why Oklahoma and Kansas look so flat and so plain. Because all the beauty surrounding all of Colorado was swept into Colorado to take away our breath when we get there. You go, that's not the way it happened. Okay, you come up with your own theory. But you understand? Just thinking about stuff is a healthy exercise and we ought to be talking to children about these mental states do you remember when 
it's fun to say to little kids, do you remember when? Do you remember when you were a little kid? Do you remember anything from when you were a little kid that was fun to do? Do you remember the first time you rode a bicycle? You do? Why are you laughing, Karen? Because I got hurt really bad. Because I got hurt really bad? Now see, I don't remember the first time I rode a bicycle. And I think it's probably because I got hurt really bad. And I don't like to remember things that hurt. But you say, I remember it. Do the rest of you remember the first time you rode a bicycle? Do, the, do you remember the first time that you went out to play in the snow and your hands got so cold you couldn't stand it? You don't remember that. Your mother came out and said, Oh no, your fingers are freezing. Let's get in the house before you suffer frostbite. Frostbite? Is that like something out in the snow is going to jump out and bite me on the fingers? No, that's just what we call what happens to your hands. So watch what I do. Why do we call it frostbite? Like the frost is biting me? By the way, you want to inflict some pain on yourself just for fun? Bite down on your little fingers. Put each finger underneath a, a tooth that will bite down on it and squeeze it real hard for a while. And then put your little fingers together and pull them and it will hurt like you can't believe what it does. Why? I'm just saying. No, why would you do that? Okay, now, see, Kara says, why would anyone do that? Okay, is there anybody here who's saying, I'm not going to do it now, but later I'll try it just to see if it really does hurt that much? I mean, that's what, see, some people say, i got to test out, is what this guy's saying really true? Or is he just, that he just makes stuff up. I'm going, no, it'll hurt. It's like hurt. when people say that you can't lick your ah! It does, doesn't it? Ah! <laughs> what, Karis? I was just going to say, it's like <laughs> people who say you can lick your elbow, but it's impossible to lick your elbow. You can't lick your elbow? Did you, know Did you hear what Karis just said? You can't lick your elbow. Now watch, someone's going to break their arm. Unless they have a long tongue, I guess. <laughs> someone's going to break their arm trying to lick their elbow. Now, and see, watch what I think. Who would want to lick their elbow anyway? You know, see, I'm willing to do this finger thing when I first heard it, but I'm not licking my elbow, even if I could. You know, it's just... And then somebody says, and you mentioned a long tongue. I knew a guy one time whose tongue was so long he could stick it out of his mouth and touch his nose. Now, that's just what? That's disgusting. That's what that is. That's just disgusting. I don't even know why he would want to go there. Okay, let's talk on page 274 about language development in little children. I've got a handout for you here because I have a theory. You know why I think a lot of little kids don't learn to talk as well as they could in that three to six year old range? Because the adults around them aren't doing the kind of things that promote language development. <coughs> so look at this handout and What's the first thing this handout suggests that you do with little kids to help them develop language? That hurts, doesn't it? Isn't this a little bit? I'm glad somebody did it. <laughs> What's the first thing you can do to help facilitate language development with little children? And for the people online, this is just a copy of page 276 in the textbook. So you can see it there. I just gave them a handout because these students don't always have their textbooks with them. <coughs> and it could be you're going to have some opportunities to interact with little children. And when those opportunities come along, what's the first thing you're going to do to facilitate language development? Now it says suggestions for parents. That's why you probably ought to make some copies of this and give it to some of your friends who are parents. What's the first thing you can do to facilitate language development in these little uh, three to six year olds? Be an active listener. Be an active listener. Listen to them just tell you stories. Listen to them talk to you. I had one daughter who, actually both of my daughters, would start to tell me something and it would, and they would just go on and on and on and on. 
Were any of you like that when you were little? Probably. Have you ever talked to a little kid who just, just goes on and on and on and on? And one time, one of my daughters said to one of her little children, get to the point, get to the point. And I'm going, what did you just say? The child who just talked and talked and talked about stuff is telling your child to get to the point? Well, I'm in a hurry, Dad. I'm going, I know. But, you know, being in a hurry can get in the way of helping our children develop their language capacities. So just be an active listener. Not only listen to what they have to say, but ask questions. Yeah, if I ask questions, they'll just keep talking more. Well, but remember, what am I doing? I'm not only connecting and bonding with this little child, but I'm also helping this little child develop their speaking abilities. I'm helping them develop their language ability. And I'm doing something that I think most grandfathers have time to do because what else are they going to do? And they might as well. See, just like that, tell me more. Ask open-ended questions. Encourage them to elaborate on what they're talking about. <clears throat> What's the second thing you can do as an adult to facilitate language development in children? Be a good role model. Use proper language when you're talking about things. And uh, just let the kids see you engaging in conversations. What's the third thing you can do? Talk to your children about things that are going on in their lives. And sometimes I will confess to you that when I ask questions of my grandchildren when we're going somewhere, so uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to stop and get something to eat? Do you want to go to the park and play? No, let's just go home, Poppy. I said, why are you so eager to get home? I don't know. Why do you ask so many questions? And sometimes I think, I'm thinking if my grandchildren, if I didn't ask them all these questions and encourage them to facilitate their thinking capacities as well as their language capacities, that they might just turn into oatmeal or something. Even if they don't like it, I'm still going to engage them in this thinking and talking process. Provide a supportive atmosphere. Talk to me later about it. I'm busy now. Don't do that. Be very supportive of what they have to say about things. <laughs> we had one grandchild when he was younger. He just loved to talk about anything to anybody. And he would talk to his parents till they couldn't till they said, I have to get dinner ready. And then he would uh, talk to his uh, sister until she would say, I have some things I have to do. And then he would come downstairs and talk to us. And he would just find somebody to talk to. And we would just sit there and listen and ask questions. And he just loved it. Well, what kind of relationship now do we have with our grandson as he's grown up? Because we were there basically providing a supportive atmosphere for him to talk to us about all this stuff. He happens to be the same one who was outside playing in the leaves like this one year, and he looks up, and I said, who made these leaves so beautiful? And he said, God did. I said, you got that right, buddy. He goes, I love you, God, and he's yelling up into the sky while he's out playing in the leaves, having a good time with him. What's the next thing on the list? One two, three, four, five. Provide a supportive atmosphere. After, after, one, after one. After read. provide a supportive atmosphere, what's the next one? Read. Read. How many of you had adults reading to you when you were little children? How many remember adults reading to you? I wonder if that contributed to your coming to college, since so many of you raised your hands. I don't recall anybody reading to me when I was a little child. We were just busy at our house, trying to eke a living out of the dirt. We were farmers and we always had so much to do. I don't recall anybody reading to me when I was a child. But when my wife and I met here at Calvary, 
got married, had children, what's something we do together? We read the Bible together. So what happens? Our little children see us reading the Bible together, and then we start reading books to them. You understand? Christians kind of have an advantage here because just some of our routines in life encourage us to read to each other. And in fact, my children were reading books before they were before they actually knew how to read the words. Did any of you do that? How did you read a book, Karis, without knowing the words? I just saw, there's just a picture that I have of me and my dad, and it's funny because he's reading like this thick theological book, and I'm like sitting there with a picture book, like I, and I was little, so I doubt I was really reading the words. So, I'm reading like my dad's reading, and he's reading his theological book, and I'm reading my picture book. And I think, little kids call that reading, you go, well that's not reading. I mean, come on, give them a break, you know, they're pretending like they're reading. And it's like, and besides, if you want them to read, say, look at the picture and tell me what's going on. And often little kids can't. In fact, if you, if you read a story to a little kid out of a book that's got pictures in it long enough, what happens after a while? They can look at the pictures and tell you the story because they get it so fixed in their minds. Have the tools of written communication available? What's it take? What, do you, what, what are called tools for writing? Crayons? pencils and paper and encourage children to communicate in writing now how can you communicate in writing before you know the letters of the alphabet and know how to put words together scribble. <coughs> what scribble scribble if i said if if i said i'm going to give you a piece of paper probably should have done that this morning and if I, i'll give you a piece of paper and I want you to draw a picture of what you see when you look out the window. Could, could a little kid do that? Could a three to six year old do that? Draw a picture of what they see out the window? Then could I put all of your pictures together and say now we have a book. We just put together a book with what? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen pages in it. And each page tells us something that you can see through the window of our classroom. You follow what's going on? We've just written a book. You say, but it's a picture book. Okay, but pictures communicate too. It doesn't always have to be words. <coughs> so have kids draw pictures. That's how we got our children when they were this age group uh, taking notes in church. We say, instead of just banging around getting bored, why don't you take notes on what the preacher's saying? And it's like, Dad, I don't know how to write. I'm going, yeah, but you can draw pictures. Draw pictures of what he's talking about. And then after they start to learn some words, whenever he says that word, write that word down and put little marks by it to see how often he said that word. And does this surprise you? One of the first words our little girls learned was like God and who God is and what God does for us. So every time, so this is a, they write God, and then every time the preacher says it, they put a mark by it, or they write it again and write it again. And then when they get home, they go, he sure talked about God a lot this morning, didn't he, Dad? Yes, he did. And you can just, because you can take the notes and talk about them later. Play sound and word games. Do, do any of you have a favorite little kid sound or word game? You don't? Sound games, like, a lot of times if I'm in a, like, classroom or something with them, and we're doing transition period, I'll say, like, repeat after me, and I'll, like, do a clap or something, and then they have to repeat it. Just, in, in fact, you could, let's see, have you ever played the game where you say a word that starts with A, and then whatever the word in, or the next person says a word that starts with B, and they go around the room? Have you ever played a game where you say a word and whatever the word ends with, the next person says a word that starts with that letter? You've not played those games. Well, could you make up a game that has to do with sounds? Bark, bark, what does that sound like? What? Bark, bark, bark. What does that sound like? A dog. 
A dog. Sounds like a dog. So what word do we use for the sound that a dog makes? Bark. Look out the window. Do you see any bark? <laughs> Where is the bark? On the tree. It's on the tree. What is that all about? Isn't, isn't bark used for some kind of food? Is bark used for a certain kind of chocolate? I don't know. Play word games. Okay, I'm going to say the word car. Now, can you think of another word that ends with A-R? What? Store. What? Store. Store. Any others? Bar. Bar. Any others? A, just go through the alphabet. You guys aren't very good at playing games. Just go through the alphabet. Far. Tar. Tar. G is gar. Jar. D is dar. Zor. What? Zor. Zor. I mean, you just run through the alphabet and you go, you, you go, what's going on here? We're just playing a game. And I said car. We said bar. We said far. We said gar. We said tar. And then I said dar. Now, see, if you were a three to six year old, you would have said, Poppy, there's no word dar. And I'm going, there could be. I mean, couldn't we think up something in the world to call dar? Oh, we could add a letter, couldn't we? And make it what? D A R T. T, dart. D A R. K, dark. You guys, you guys need to play more word games. <laughs> this stuff is so much fun. Yeah. Apparently you're not having as much fun as I am. Okay. If your child shows difficulties, let the child finish the communication. Don't finish it for them. Be patient with the child. And, and don't be critical of what the child is saying. Just be accepting of it because with time, they will uh, eventually, what I call refine, they'll refine their language abilities. And uh, you'll be amazed at how proficient they will, come, they will become in terms of talking about things. Page, oh, page 291. It's time for chapter 9. Page 291. What's it talking about on page 291? Oh, self-regulation. Do you have any self-regulation? Yes. What do you do that's the result of learning self-regulation? What did you do this morning when you got up that you were taught is a part of self-regulation? Did anyone brush their teeth this morning? Why? I did it last night. <laughs> oh, I brushed my teeth last night. Why? Because what was I taught by the adults in my world? Brush your teeth? What will brushing my teeth do for me? No one was ever given a reason. You just did it. I remember saying to my parents, why do I have to brush my teeth every day? And it, did any of you ask your parents that? What did your parents say? So you don't get cavities. So you don't get cavities. <clears throat> my poor grandson, <laughs> one of my grandsons, <laughs> his mother would say when he was little, did you brush your teeth? 
And he would go, yes, Mom. She said, come here. And she would breathe his mouth to see if it smelled good or not. I go, whoa, I'm glad my mother didn't do that to me. Because she's saying, you'll have bad breath if you don't brush your teeth. I'm thinking, no, I like the cavities one thing better. Just that seems like a, a better reason for self-regulation. You won't have to have any you won't have to have any fillings when you go to see the dentist. So you learn to brush your teeth? Have you learned to do anything else? Who woke you up when you were a little child to go to school? Who got you out of bed to get ready to go to school? Did you wake yourself up to go to school? Who woke you up to go to school? Your mom? What did she do? How did she do it? Did she come in and say, it's time to get up and go to school? When I was younger. <laughs> As I got older, it wasn't quite that. As you got older, it was? <laughs> she was more like, hey, I know hey. what you're like. Get out of your bed because I yeah. feel like no. You can't sleep all day. It's time to get up. You've got, to go, got things you have to do. <laughs> yeah. So now that you're not living at home and your mother does, oh, does anyone's mother still call them every morning on the phone to wake them up so they'll be sure and get here for class on time? So how is it you got to class on time? What did you do? Set an alarm. Set an alarm? How many enjoy alarm clocks? Not me. I'm thinking, do you like your alarm clock? Does it make a nice noise? My, it does? Oh, maybe that's what I should do is get an alarm clock with music because the one I have just makes this awful noise <laughs> that bothers me. <coughs> On the other hand, I have an alarm clock that goes off at 7 o'clock at night in the evening and it, it has music on it. I don't like that one either. I just don't like an alarm going off and interrupting whatever I'm doing. I'm working on the computer and at seven o'clock the radio kicks on and uh, starts playing some kind of music. It doesn't matter what music it's playing, I just don't like it. And I get up and turn it off. Why would I have an alarm clock going off at seven o'clock in the evening? Oh, I, <clears throat> when you get old, you'll learn this. I have medicine I have to take every 12 hours. Take it in the morning and take it at night to keep my blood thin so I won't have a stroke. That's what they say anyway. So I have to take it and, and I forget sometimes in the evening because I'm busy. <clears throat> they say, well, won't your wife remind you? No, she forgets too, so I have to set an alarm. And I do not like listening to alarms. Well, then why do you use them, Tom? because I want to take my medicine on a timely basis. You follow? Why? I want to get to class on time. I use the alarm to substitute for what my mother used to do when I was a little kid. That's called self-regulation. I mean, when you go home over break, when, when you leave here to go home over whatever the next break is we have, is the first thing your mother going to say to you, have you been brushing your teeth every day? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, it's so good to see me. See you. Tell you. Tell me about what's going on in your life. And do you say, "Well, I decided to quit brushing my teeth just to see if I really would get cavities." <laughs> no, it's like some things we say. No, you just do that. That's just a routine in life. I've learned to regulate myself, and that's why I think the word regulation maybe does, has a bad connotation to it. But let's just face it: we all need a certain amount of regulation. And in our society, if you, don't, if you don't learn to regulate yourself, then you don't fit in. And if you don't fit in often enough, then you don't get to stay living in a free society with all the freedoms that we have. If you go to a store and you see something you want, you're walking through the store and you say, oh, look at that candy bar. I wonder what it tastes like. And if you just tear it open and start eating it, 
and then you get back to the fruit section and you say, wow, that apple looks good, and you just pick it up and start eating it. And then you go by the milk section and say, chocolate milk, I'll take some of that. You just open it and start drinking it. Does, does anyone come up to you and say anything? You go, I don't know, I've never tried it. Well, don't try it. You'll probably, what would happen if you did that? You would probably get arrested. They, would, they do it at Walmart all the time. They do? Yeah. And nobody does anything about it? No, I just look at it. I mean, you just pay for it. They make you pay for it. And then if you're causing too much of a disruption, they'd probably kick you out. What if you don't pay for it? What if you just drink some chocolate milk and drink part of it and put the lid on and stick it back on the shelf? <laughs> That's disgusting. See, the world I grew up in, you did stuff like that. The guy who owns the store would come and take you by the ear and usher you outside and say, you're not allowed in my store. And if you showed up at the front door, he'd say, don't come in. You're not allowed here. You just come in here and steal stuff. And if I caused a ruckus, he would have said, well, guess what? We'll call the police and have you arrested. Has the world changed? Do we not, do we not expect people to regulate themselves anymore? One of my daughters had a job one time working at a store where she said, Dad, it's unbelievable. The store's policy is you don't confront shoplifters. Have any of you worked at a store like that? Where if you see a shoplifter, you just let them go. And she said, that's just wrong to let people come in here and just steal stuff and walk out the door with it. I mean, it's pretty obvious. They've got their coat stuffed full of things that they put inside. Just stop them and somehow teach them that this is not the way to live. Or I suppose the option would be to have someone on staff at the store who follows those people to their house and then he goes in their house and steals all their stuff. I mean, if you're stealing stuff from the store, wouldn't it be okay if I steal stuff from you? Well, no, that would be wrong. Well, then guess what? It's wrong when you do it too. And obviously we have some people in this world who haven't learned self-regulation. I mean, when I hear that somebody got, well, I just saw a highlight on the news recently. It's pretty sad. Here, here's a guy going down the road in a two-lane road. Here's a car, and here's a guy behind him, and this guy decides to pass. Okay? So guess what happens? There's another car behind this guy, and he decides to pass him and go on the side of the road. Now, what do you think is going to happen when here's a guy in his lane, here's a guy passing in this lane, and this guy passes on the shoulder of the road, and he goes around both of them? The guy who was going around both of them, this guy had a camera in his car, the guy who was going around both of them, he hit, the, he hit some dirt, his car flipped over, rolled about three times, and he died. Does that tell you anything? Did any of you take driver's training before you drove a car? Did you, who took driver's training? Did they show films in driver's training class about people doing stupid stuff in their cars that killed them? They didn't? Did, did they in yours? What kind of films did they show? It was just animation. Animation? Of people being reckless on the road. And then the And it showed what happened? See when I was in when I was in high school, it wasn't animation. They had real films. And I lived in a part of the world where there were railroad tracks everywhere and trains coming down those tracks pretty fast. And they showed pictures of what happens to people who try to beat a train to a railroad crossing and get hit by the train. And it showed the cars all mangled. And they showed pictures of the people laying on the ground, dead as a doornail next to the car. And I still remember to this day, I, I can't drive over a railroad crossing without looking to see if there's a car coming because it made such an impression on my mind. Maybe we've decided that it's so traumatic 
to show people the consequences of not being self-regulatory <coughs> that we've forgotten some of this stuff. So, uh, where did you learn to control your... Okay, who taught you how to brush your teeth and get up on time to get to class in the morning? Your parents? So your parents taught you self-regulation. Did they teach you... They, okay, they taught you how to control your behavior. Did they teach you how to control your emotions? Do any of you remember your parents talking to you about when you got real emotional about something? You were having a meltdown. What did they say to you? You don't recall ever having an emotional meltdown and your parents talking to you about it? I See? remember getting angry when my parents telling me to maybe count to ten or go pray. Okay, there you go. See, that's emotions. I get real angry about something and they say, No, don't don't get don't do something that you shouldn't do. Count to ten. Go pray about it. Anybody else taught some way to handle your emotions? If you weren't taught how to handle your emotions by your parents or your caregivers, then guess what? This is the beauty of the age you live in. Go to Google and just <coughs> Google, how can I learn to regulate my own emotions? And it'll just give you all kinds of websites to look at and a whole bunch of suggestions. You can pick the ones that you think are best. I think that counting to 10, praying about it, good suggestions. Anybody else have some things your parents taught you to do to control your emotions? When you're stressed out, you can make a to-do list and it helps you calm down sometimes. Okay, you get stressed out, too many things to do, make a to-do list. And then start at the top. And if you don't get everything done, at the end of the day, say, I had 10 things on my list, I only got seven done. Wow, look at the seven you got done. The other three, we'll work on them tomorrow. We'll put them on another day. Were any of you taught uh, self-regulation in terms of your thoughts? You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking I'm just going to sleep in this morning. It's rainy. It's cold outside. I just think I'll stay here in bed. Turn my alarm off and go back to sleep. When my alarm goes off, I do not reach over, even though it's, I can reach it from where I'm sleeping, I do not reach over and turn it off. That is a bad idea. Why is that a bad idea? I'm the only one that suffers from a, a, a love of sleep. You'll fall back to sleep. I'll fall back to sleep. So I don't turn it off till I'm sitting up on the edge of the bed with my feet on the floor, and then I turn it off. Yes? I have to get up, I have to get up and turn my alarm off. You have to get out of bed, because if you're on the bed and you turn it off, you're tempted to lay back down again. So you say, I have to get out and go across the floor to turn it off. Then once I'm up, I can stay up. It doesn't stop me. What? That doesn't, that doesn't stop you. I get no? up and go turn it off and go back in my bed. <laughs> well, Harris, you're still working on self-regulation, <laughs> aren't you? And we all are to some degree in some area of life, but it's like I have to find mechanisms that help me learn to regulate myself. I'm driving down the road and somebody's driving real slow in front of me. If the speed limit's 65 on the highway, then why is someone driving 50? Good question. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to be in my pickup rather than this car so I could just run into the back of them and bump them and tell them to get on down the road. Well, that's a terrible thought, Don. Yes? And are you actually going to do it? No, because <coughs> I've learned to regulate my behavior no matter what I'm inclined to do. Every now and then, some guy in a big old truck runs me off the road or passes me and, or gets right up on my bumper and I'm thinking, now see this is a commentary <coughs> on the movies I used to watch. 
I'm thinking what I need to do is pull over and get out my 357 Magnum and just blow the engine right out of his truck when he goes by. That is not a good idea. Now see, I've actually said that once in a while when I'm driving down the road and my wife goes, Tom, I can't believe you would even think that, let alone say it. What did my wife do? She didn't watch those movies. Those, who was that? Clint Eastwood blowing things away with that 357 Magnum? I'm thinking, you know, maybe if I hadn't watched so many of those violent movies, I wouldn't have had so many of these violent thoughts. Well, just make sure you don't entertain them, Tom, and do it because <laughs> can't you see the headlines? Professor at Calvary University gets arrested for blowing the engine out of an F-150 just because the guy got up on his bumper. I wouldn't have a job, folks. I just have to learn to regulate myself. Every now and then, somebody gets on the news and says something bizarre, and I said to Nina, I think I'm going to call them up on the phone and tell them a thing or two. She goes, yeah, well, do you like your job? Because it could be that they could make enough noise to get you fired. Okay, I believe I better regulate that part of my life. <laughs> Self-regulation requires several skills. What are some of these skills you need to regulate yourself? Awareness of, the textbook says demands, but really awareness of expectations. What am I expected to do? What's expected of me as a law-abiding citizen? What's expected of me as a college student? What's expected of me as a college professor? I'm aware of the expectations. They call them demands, but I like the word expectations. The second thing that is required is monitoring my behavior, both my internal and external thoughts and emotions and my, my internal thoughts and emotions and my external behavior. Monitoring it. Monitoring it. Tom, you're sitting at a traffic light and the light turns green and the car in front of you is just sitting there. What are they doing? Probably talking on their cell phone. Well, are you going to get upset and honk your horn at them? Or are you just going to find something that's more beneficial to do that isn't going to change the situation but helps you monitor your behavior so you don't get bent out of shape and well one time I was driving to preach at a church in a little town south of here and a car was in front of me at a stoplight and the light turned green and I wanted to hit my horn so bad say beep get on down the road and I thought, no, Tom, that's not appropriate. Just pray about what you're going to preach on today. Turn on the radio and sing a song or something. Do something that's more productive. And so I started praying about the service I was going to be preaching in and the church I was going to and that kind of thing and be sensitive to the people there. And so I, after the light turned green, I just kept praying while I'm driving down the road. And I'm still following this car that's kind of limping along, like they're not sure where they're going. And they turn on their turn signal. And guess where they did? They pulled into the parking lot of the church where I was going to preach. I'm sure glad I didn't blast my horn at them back there at that traffic light. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> And by the way, that's another thing. When your parents say, go talk to God about it, we need to often talk to God about helping us monitor our behavior and our thoughts and our emotions. And the third thing it says to do is become aware of your successes. I mean, just be aware of the places where God gives you a victory in life and helps you learn to regulate yourself. And areas where you need to work on regulation, ask God to help you in that area. Pray about it. Talk to him about it. And ask him to help me find something on Google that will help me. It happens that self-regulation, here's what the textbook says. Self-regulation, the better you are at self-regulation, the better you'll be in terms of academic performance, the better problem solver you'll be, the better reading comprehension you'll have, the better relationships you'll have with your peers, the, you'll be more motivated, 
you'll have a greater sense of self-worth you'll you'll be more competent you'll feel more powerful and you'll have higher moral standards and conduct yourself in a more moral manner now that's enough right there to say I want to work on self-regulation so page 292 talks about the ways that adults try to direct children's behavior and the ways that adults try to do this affects how quickly and how well self-regulation skills are developed so how did your how did the adults in your life try to direct your behavior can you think of anything that when you were younger that adults parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles or even teachers at church and at school can you think of anything they did how did they go about directing your behavior they praise you when you do good things they what they praised you when you were doing things that were appropriate that they approved of my dad had this phrase <coughs> I didn't go to church when I was younger, but he had this phrase. He said, son, bonines don't do that kind of stuff. Any of you raised with that thing that your last name was important to your parents? And if you're going to wear that name, you better live accordingly. Don't go around bringing shame to the bonine name. And I thought, I really thought one time, what's the big deal? Bonine doesn't have any kind of famous ring to it. But I knew. I mean, when your father sets you down and says, Son, some of those bums you're hanging out with are probably going to end up in jail. And he said, The thing is, their parents will bail them out. And here's what he said to me. I just want you to know, and I'm just going to tell you this one time, and that always meant it was very, very important. He said, if you get thrown in jail with some of those hoodlums you're hanging out with, don't tell them your name is Boni. Just sit there and rot rather than embarrass my name. So what happened is, some of the hoodlums I was hanging out with, when they would do things that could get them thrown in jail, I would say, sorry guys, you have an escape hatch. Your parents will bail you out. My dad won't. And they said, oh, yes, he would. I said, no, he wouldn't. He already told me, you can sit there and rot. And later, when I was grown, I went back and thanked him. I said, Dad, I want to thank you for keeping me from getting arrested when I was younger because of what you told me about my hoodlum friends. And he said, I said, but you told me I could just sit there in jail and rot. He said, well, he said, I probably wouldn't have done that. Now, he said that now that I'm a grown adult and living a, a, an adult responsible life, I'm telling you, my dad was so proud of his name, he would have done that. I mean, he would have said, I don't know the boy. I don't know who you're talking about. My, my kids are all right here at the house. This one doesn't belong to me. So it worked in my case. Now you might say, that's pretty drastic. <laughs> but probably my mother would have said, your father had to be drastic because you were a drastic case. You needed some serious help along the way. Page 295. How did you learn to be a moral person? How did you learn to be a moral person? Were you taught not to steal? Who taught you not to steal? Church, my parents. That your church and your parents my mother taught me not to steal I mean she never said anything about it but I was at the grocery store one time and I stole some bubble gum my, my little brother goes we're in the car in the parking lot at the grocery store and my brother goes Tommy where did you get the bubble gum and I said, Shut up. <laughs> he goes, Mom, Tommy's got some bubble gum and I didn't get any. And the next thing I know is her hand is over the seat. She grabs me like this by the shirt. And the next thing, I'm over the seat in the front seat with her right in my face. And she's going, Where did you get that bubble gum? And I said, In the store. She said, You didn't have any money. I said, 
I saw somebody else take some, so I thought it was okay to just take, as long as you just take one piece. She goes, you know better than that. And I thought, I thought, no, I don't, but I'm not going to say it now because I'm about to die. <laughs> and she said, I can't believe you did that. And <coughs> she opened the door. She still got me by the shirt. She drags me into the store. She walks up to the counter. Remember those counters, those little shelves, like a banking place? She walks up to the counter and see if there's a reset high. And she puts my neck right on the counter and she's leaning on me and I'm going, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. <laughs> and she says to the store owner, this boy of mine stole some bubble gum. And he goes, it's okay. She goes, it's not okay. And, and I'm thinking, he better cooperate or I'm going to die right here at this <laughs> counter. And she said, and I'm here to pay for it. And he said, well, it's okay, it's just a penny. She said, I don't care how much it is. And she's reaching in her pocket, leaning out on me, and I'm, and I'm having trouble breathing. And she pays the money, and she grabs me and drags me back to the car. Now, I know that's pretty traumatic, okay? I was traumatized. And there's probably some social worker out there that says your mother shouldn't have done that. I'll tell you what, I never ever stole anything after that in my life. It just, it just broke me of ever thinking about doing that. Because that was important to my parents. <laughs> I wish I'd have had church and somebody else helped well, me learn how to do that. I stole something in church one time. <laughs> and what? I stole something from church one time, and, and I knew it was wrong, and my mom made me pay back, like pay the money back for it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like your parents teach you not to steal. Did your parents teach you not to use, We they called it at my house, foul language. Did any of you get your mouth washed out with soap? Did that happen? I mean, all you did was hear a new word on the playground, and you go home and say, and say, Mom, what does this mean? She goes, where's the soap? And I'm washing your mouth out. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I just heard it on the playground. I told my daughters when they heard stuff, when you hear a word that you don't know what it is, think about the way they said it, and ask yourself, would they say that word in the classroom in front of the teacher? Probably not. And if they wouldn't, then don't use it. It's probably an inappropriate word. And of course, my dad, his theory was that people who use foul language, filthy language, are people who just aren't very well educated. They're just not smart enough to have a big enough vocabulary to express themselves in other ways. And I've learned since then that wasn't true because I know some very highly educated people who use terrible language just because they're doing it for emphasis or something. I don't know why they're doing it. But do you have some adults in your life who helped you become a moral person? Have you ever sent them an email or a phone call and said thank you for helping me become a moral person? Well, we're going to stop there and pick up on the rest of this. Make a mark. Pick up on the rest of this on Friday. I know I'm a little behind, but we'll get caught up. We'll get caught up. It will happen. For the exam that's due today, um, is the exam how, due today? Yeah, at least from what I saw. How 